Right Honorable Hubert Ingram, our Prime Minister, the Honorable Dr. Earl DeVoe, Minister of the Environment, the Honorable Fenton Nemore, Minister of State and Minister of the Environment, Dean Mustafi, I'm sure I messed up your name. Mr. Mr. Neil McKinney, President of the Bahamas National Trust. Mr. Colin Higgs, Permanent Secretary. Ms. Diana Lightman, Permanent Secretary. Other senior government officials, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. We're all here to talk about a fragile chain of violence that in the 1950s, Howard Hughes thought would be a wonderful place to buy and purchase as a playground. Um, fortunately, government of the day entertained a proposal by a group of concerned citizens, and we were fortunate enough to have set aside a part of that chain, which is now the Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park. Outside of the Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park, however, a lot happens, and as you would read in your aims, which the aims of the conference, which is, which is, is, is listed in your, in your program, the outside of the Exuma Park, there are also many challenges and opportunities. And as, as the Minister of the Environment started thinking um, about, he's been to the, the, Exuma, the Exuma Park a couple of times, I had the pleasure of going there with him last year. And a lot of discussions started, um, were undertaken about um, how much stuff happening outside the park is impacting what happens inside the park. We also, we also started looking at how much development was actually happening. As we flew over, I mean, it was, wow, that's happening here, that's happening here. When you fly over and you see how close it all is, you realize how interrelated it all is. And then you realize that it really is not properly planned. There is no clear commitment to the sustainability of the development that's taking place. And governments have to make terrible decisions sometimes about terribly hard decisions sometimes about balancing, protecting the environment with providing jobs and somewhere in between, et cetera. And it's not often, and it's not possible to do it properly without planning. Many of you, all of you should be aware that the government of the Bahamas passed a very progressive piece of legislation called the Planning and Subdivisions Act. And that act allows for the establishment or for the development of land use plans. So for a particular space defined in the act, we have the ability to plan for what happens there. Those of us that protect the environment and sometimes get uh, accused of being a little bit too green freaky, have to also sit in the same room with a developer who is interested in providing jobs. And so that balance that must be struck, we have the ability to sit down and chart how that happens by developing these land use plans. And, and we believe the dialogue that we will start today with this conference will take the Exuma Keys far along the path of, of getting that land use plan, that much needed la land use plan. So on behalf of the Minister of Environment and the government and of the Bahamas National Trust, and we're really pleased to have the, the Harvard Graduate School of Design, and the Dean represents that, that wonderful institution, and so many wonderful speakers. And so today, we're going to have a wonderful discussion about what's important to our country and how do we look at this incredibly fragile but great space called the Exuma Keys and look at the opportunities and balance that against the challenges. And at the end of the day, a process which may take um, a couple of months will have started. And so thank you all very much for coming and we really do hope you have a wonderful time with us today. I'm going to call our first brief speaker this morning's opening session. Mr. Neil McKinney is a uh, He's been associated with the National Trust longer than uh, he, he really knows because his grandfather was a founding member of the Bahamas National Trust. His father was a president of the Bahamas National Trust, and Neil follows in that part. So I'd like to welcome at this time the president of the Bahamas National Trust, Mr. Neil McKinney, who will bring remarks. Thank you, Eric, for that introduction. Um, we're on a very tight, 
time frame here, and so with protocol already having been established, I'm going to pass that by and welcome all of you and thank you all for being here. Um, in 10 minutes, which is the time I've been allotted, I can't possibly go over all of the matters which affect sustainability in Exuma, the entire Exumas, and so I'm going to deal with a portion of it because there are also other people here who are far better able and more knowledgeable about other areas. One of my main concerns for the Exumas and for the Bahamas is actually to do with our marine reserves. And uh, that's just as important within the Exumas as it is for the rest of the Bahamas. And I'm going to open my remarks with a passage, strangely, no one, nothing that uh, Harvard should be too upset about, but it's from Cornell's Laboratory of Ornithology from a home study course by J.W. Fitzpatrick. And the title is, chapter, is um, Bird Conservation. The passenger pigeon is almost certainly the most abundant bird ever to have existed on Earth. Explorers account for its numbers across the eastern United States between 1630 and 1880 read to us like science fiction. Audubon wrote of a flock passing for three successive days near Louisville, Kentucky in 1813, stating that the light of the noonday sun was obscured as by an eclipse. He estimated that this mile-wide flock contained a million, a minimum of 1.1 billion birds. How many pigeons existed across the entire range of the species? Nobody knows for sure, but the number may have been five billion or more. One thing we do know, as of 1914, just 100 years after Audubon saw his massive flock, the passenger pigeon was extinct. I chose to start with this passage to illustrate that sustainability is not about the abundance or the scarcity of a particular resource, but about its proper management. And you may ask, how does the demise of the passenger pigeon relate to sustainability in the exumas? There are parallels. There were several factors that led to the demise of the passenger pigeon, but it was the unrestrained hunting that was the dominant factor in its extinction. And we have a similar situation here in the Bahamas today, whereby once a season is opened, whether it be grouper or crawfish, there are no limits. For conch, there is no closed season and there are no limits. Is this sustainable? We still commercially fish spawning aggregations. Scientifically, we know this is not sustainable and these aggregations will eventually disappear. The challenges we face in the Exumas today are systemic. We have arrived where we are today as a result of our historical use of our marine resources. Traditionally, we have looked at the seas and its bounty as an open and unlimited resource for its taking. As long as we had a small Bahamian population and demand was low, and the methods employed to harvest these marine resources were relatively inefficient, the system worked and it was sustainable. Today, the pressure on our marine resources is far greater, as the methods employed to harvest them are far more efficient than those of earlier days. We also have both a growing population and ever more visitors to our shores. We already know that many of our resources are in severe decline, and it would be foolish to expect a reversal of that trend without a change in management and policy. A first step might be a full assessment of the resources that are available. Without that knowledge, it is hard to see how it is possible to claim that what is harvested is sustainable. Indeed, in other regimes, Quotas are set, and once they are achieved, seasons are closed. 
Our government, as Eric already mentioned, has committed to having 20% of our marine areas as parks or reserves by the year 2020. This is an impressive commitment. And just as the Exuma Land and Sea Park replenishes areas outside of its boundaries, so too can other reserves function in a similar manner. At the same time, as we seek to protect these resources for future generations, we also need to provide meaningful opportunities for the people who live within the Exumas, such that they can use these same resources to support themselves. Opportunities in tourism, marinas, diving, mariculture, etc., needed to be blended in with conservation such that the inhabitants of these areas value the resources and are both proponents and guardians. As we talk of sustainability, there are many more questions than we have answers. Inevitably, because so much of our country is water, the questions revolve around the marine environment. Some of you may feel that my talk is too general and that I have not focused on the exumas. My response is that an oil spill does not respect artificial boundaries. Lionfish do not care which island is close by. Climate change is not a local issue. The acidification of the oceans, which destroys limestone and therefore many of the animals that live in it are unable to build their shells, these are all national as well as local issues. Ideas or policies that are formulated from this conference are likely to be used for other areas in the Bahamas. The future of the Exumas is inextricably bound up with the rest of the nation. If we are to maintain our resources, at some time there must be a plan that is national in scope. This is not in any way to take away or detract from the work or ideas that are put forward here today. There must be a starting point. And lessons can be learned and policy and management refined as we find the methods that work here in Exuma and discard others. How will we know if the measures we take are successful? How do we define success? I would suggest to you that good science can help us measure our progress. Once we establish goals or objectives and start with good baseline information, with proper programs in place, we can measure the success or otherwise of policies. Ironically, if we do a good job, the pressure on our resources will increase. That may sound counterintuitive, but if you think about it, there will be more visitors who wish to visit and come and see the pristine environment that we have here in the Bahamas. Properly managed, this can help us support a growing local population. As fishing grounds outside of our country are further depleted or degraded, there will be greater demands for access to our resources. This will come both in formal requests and also, sorry, and also in the form of illegal intrusions that we now suffer in the form of poaching. We will need sound policies to manage requests for commercial fishing and strong enforcement to ensure that legal fishing operations are within required parameters and that those who poach are caught and severely discouraged from returning. So there are many factors that I haven't mentioned or talked about, as I said, things like health and education, which I will leave to others who are far more competent than I to talk about those. But I would like to say that this is a wonderful opportunity to plan and help guide the future sustainable development of the Exumas. And I look forward to hearing the comments and ideas that will be put forward through the rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. McKinney. In the mid-1600s, 
a struggling colony in the Bahamas uh, was sent supplies by people in New England. And as a showing of, of, uh, of their gratitude, the people sent a ship laden with tons of Brazilito wood. And that became, and that at that time was, was the largest gift that the fledgling Harvard College had received. It was a major gift to Harvard. And so it is not by coincidence that Harvard is back, is giving back something to the Bahamas. And I would like to call at this time Dean Mosen Mostofavi, who is the Dean of the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Welcome, sir. Good morning and uh, welcome. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here with you uh, this morning. Um, thank you. Lots of mics. Great. I think what Eric doesn't uh, maybe know, uh, um, he didn't mention it, and I certainly maybe Neil didn't know, is that before going to uh, the Graduate School of Design at Harvard, I was actually at Cornell University. <laughs> so so it's, it's wonderful to hear about uh, the whole work on ornithology that they do, and uh, I did have the pleasure of working with a number of people and actually spending time uh, in their building, and very much hope that some of the things that, uh, that they do in a way is also very much aligned with, uh, with things that, that we do and we think about. Really want to uh, thank the Honorable Prime Minister for, for your presence here today and the Honorable Minister. Um, it's been incredible over the past many months as we have been preparing this event to have the opportunity to spend time with the Minister and to find out how the minister and uh, Neil and Eric and so many other people, uh, I'm afraid to go on thanking too many people. It's like the Oscars, they might start playing that music and I'll need to, to sit down. But they've been so incredibly committed to the Exumas, to the future of the Bahamas and to really thinking um, about um, innovative ways in which we should be caring and, and really dealing with the custodianship of, uh, of these islands. And for us, uh, it's also a, a real privilege to have been introduced, in a way, to this, uh, to this uh, project through uh, the, the Aga Khan programs at uh, Harvard University. Uh, and I'm really grateful to, to everyone uh, who has been involved with this particular project. Um, we certainly hope that um, we are able to return something uh, of a gift back to the Exumas, but we actually also feel that we are getting still more of a gift by being part of this project and, and being here today. You may well ask, what is the relationship between a design school, in a way, and Exumas? And maybe some people are not familiar with the fact that we're dealing at the Graduate School of Design with a broad range of topics and issues in architecture, in landscape architecture, in urban planning, in urban design. And it's very important to recognize that today, when we're dealing with large-scale environmental issues, we really, as has already been mentioned, both deal with questions of preservation and conservation, but actually think in terms of the future possibilities. And that means imagining. That means questions of creativity. You can't simply deal, as Neil was, was, was suggesting, with the, with the future through a process of preservation. Pr preservation also is deeply uh, intermingled with ideas for the well-being of society and for the good of, of, of mankind. And in that sense, the question of what one does, how one imagines things, what are the kinds of possibilities and projects, this becomes a very important part of uh, what we have to, to discuss. 
very briefly, I just want to also um, explain something of the logic of the meeting that we have today. Those of you who've had the opportunity to look at uh, the, uh, the program for the day would have noticed that we are starting the morning session really with the specifics. And in the afternoon, probably we're dealing more with general issues and then returning to the specific. In other words, in the morning we will hear from people who are deeply involved with the particularities of the, the Exumas, the Bahamas, and then in the afternoon we will actually have some presentations, including my own presentation, that will be much more dealing with comparative models, what can we learn from other places, what are other examples of things, what are the kinds of issues that are important, because I think that, that we should not, in a way, end up also focusing so much on the exumas that we actually miss the relationship between the exumas and the other things. So that's really something about the, uh, the structure of, uh, of, the, of the conference. Uh, one of the key issues today is really the relationship between, if you like, bottom-up forms of urbanization and top-down forms of urbanization. What are the kinds of things that can happen at the grassroots level and what are the kinds of things that need to happen in terms of of planning, anticipating how we are um, thinking about future possibilities. And I would argue that we need both of these. We can't have a focus solely on top-down forms of planning, nor should we solely rely on bottom-up forms of, 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 of organization. Therefore, how we balance these things, what is the relationship between these things, is absolutely critical. The other thing that I think is, is, is important is that in the future, there will be so much emphasis on how we're dealing with questions of water urbanization. The relationship between water and urbanization will be a key feature of actually global planning policies and issues. And, and again, in that sense, uh, we have a number of people here who are very much um, uh, focusing their research and expertise on questions of related to water. The other side of this is really the relationship between larger environmental topics and uh, issues of health. And I think these are many of the themes that we have uh, tried to bring together uh, in this conference. Clearly, the relationship between small-scale buildings and large-scale planning is the overall all sort of theme that's, uh, that's at stake behind uh, the, 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 the technical, the scientific focus on the exumas. I am, for one, I'm hopeful that this conference will not be a one-off thing. That, in fact, with the support of the Prime Minister, with the support of the Minister and all of you, that there will be really genuine opportunities for us to continue this collaboration and to see this conference as really the first of a number of events that will look at a variety of themes and issues that will be pertinent to the future of Exumas and really the relationship of Exumas to larger issues of, of planning uh, in the Bahamas. So thank you very much and like everyone else, I'm very, very excited about what we're going to hear today. Thank you. The Honourable Earl DeVoe will now come and introduce the Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Eric. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is indeed a distinct pleasure for me to introduce the person I believe is the architect of much of our conservation, protection and sustainability. I have great difficulty trying to confine my message to a short introduction, Prime Minister. So I'll just use two examples. Once on a small plane flying over Abaco with Eleanor Phillips, the Prime Minister leaned out the window as we approached the wetlands and the mouths of Abaco and said to Eleanor, all of this should be protected and it should be under your charge if you could but manage it. Just this week, the Prime Minister reflected with his Minister of Agriculture and Marine Resources about the turtles that he saw on Long Island. 
that by his hand he protected last year. The Prime Minister loves to eat turtle stew. He's an Abaco man, but yet, by his hand, he protected and prohibited the harvesting of turtles and was marveling at the bounty of turtles coming out of a pond. And when the minister remarked at how many eggs they found on the beach, I could see his reflection change and the delight increase in his face that the turtles were coming back. I use these two illustrations to make the point that in protecting the hills, the wetlands, in passing the Planning and Subdivision Act, in the Forestry Act, in making an endowment to the Bahamas National Trust that was 10 times bigger than it ever was, and in protecting sharks, and finally, in ensuring that close to a million acres of the Bahamas' land and marine area are under permanent protection, the Prime Minister has demonstrated far greater than any other world leader his commitment to sustainability. And as I indicated to the gathering earlier this week when we announced the protection of sharks, the environmental community in the Bahamas has no better friend than Hubert Ingram. And so I would invite you to stand as we invite him to the podium to bring his remarks. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you. And thank you, Minister DeVoe. The reality is that people like Lynn Holovesco and yourself and Teresa Butler and others drilled in my head 20 years ago how I ought to become very concerned with the environment. Thank you all very much for coming. Mr. President, Mr. Dane, I'm pleased to, to be here to say a few words on the launch of this Environmental Management Design and Planning Conference and to acknowledge formally the collaboration of the Bahamas government with the Bahamas National Trust and the Harvard University Graduate School of Design in the realization of this meeting and to express my appreciation to the Gaga Khan Foundation for the part which they played in causing this conference to come about. <clears throat> this conference will provide us with the opportunity to undertake activities to assist in educating and informing citizens on important matters related to environmental protection and conservation. And it is supportive of the planning and management initiatives underway at the Ministry of Environment in fulfillment of the standards and requirements of the Planning and Subdivisions Act of 2010. The natural environment, inclusive of its conservation and enhancement, has long been of importance to the government of the Bahamas, as evidenced by the fact that the establishment of the Exoma Land and Sea Park, the oldest park of its kind, dates back to 1959. Additionally, the park has been managed by the Bahamas National Trust, which itself was established by an act of parliament. And uh, in 1986, new bylaws for the Exoma Land and Sea Park declared the park as a no-take zone on Moraine Fisheries Reserve. The Sea Park in Exoma is unparalleled in beauty with pristine biodiversity a true treasure in the Bahamas. Indeed, it is truly a bountiful treasure, a marine resources and a replenishment area, continually providing young conchs, groupers, and crawfish to the waters surrounding this national treasure. It is therefore, in my view, appropriate that the Exomas, the home of this park, has been selected to benefit from the knowledge expertise, experience, and advice of all of you gathered here today. Effective planning and responsible environmental management will be critical to the future development of the Exomas and indeed the future development of all of the Bahamas. Planning for the future development of the Bahamas 
presents the challenge of fostering the well-being of the people, while at the same time preserving the natural beauty and unique ecology of our archipelago. Notwithstanding this challenge, much has been accomplished, and of course, there's much more to be done. Back in 1992, when I first came to office, we began a dialogue with concerned and interested environmentalists with a view to enhancing the conservation of our natural environment, an extremely vital component of our tourism product. During our terms in office, we have maintained our commitment to ensuring, to the best we can, responsible environmental stewardship. We do have a shortage of trained staff, inadequacy and insufficiency of trained persons to do the management for ourselves, but we continue to try. We've sought to advance the national dialogue to embrace many facets of environmental protection and conservation and to adopt initiatives which would best serve the interests of the Bahamian people. We have developed policies to promote sustainable development of our resources. We have enacted legislation necessary for the implementation of our policy for environmental sustainability. Specifically, some of the things we've done was the establishment of the BEST Commission um, in response to important international environmental initiatives and uh, to develop and require environmental impact assessments on all proposals for major developments in the Bahamas was the original purpose of the BEST Commission. Originally, we only required EIAs from foreign investments, foreign direct investors, um, and in respect of large projects. Now, of course, this is happening for all significant developments. And, of course, as I said before, we have inadequacy and insufficiency of skilled persons in the implementation of our intended environmental le legal positions. We have enacted a number of pieces of legislation to protect trees and uh, outlawed long line fishing, prohibiting the fishing for Nassau Grouper. And now I understand Mr. McKinney has in his head something about the conch, not, not, not long from now. <clears throat> As I said to my colleagues when they did the shark regulation, I said, you know, environmentalists, they have one at a time. As soon as you finish this, they'll have another one, and another one, and another one. It's an unending process. In, back in 1999, we caused an inventory to be undertaken of the 40 creek systems in the Bahamas, and it had become badly degraded and in desperate need of rehabilitation and management, and thereafter spearheaded the study of degraded creeks and establishment and established National Creek and Wetlands Restoration Initiative. In early 2002, we doubled the size of our national parks managed by the Bahamas National Trust. And in, 19, and in 2009, to mark the 50th anniversary of the National Trust, we further expanded the national park system to include additional important marine areas in Andrus and around the Conception Island Land Park and created a new national park at Fowl Key in the Abacos. And since May of 2007, we've increased our budgetary assistance to the National Trust tenfold to a million dollars in recognition of its expanded responsibility. And of course, we enacted the Planning and Subdivisions Act of 2010, um, which calls for development of land use plans for each island in the country. Our new Forestry Act of 2010 is designed to assist the sustainable development and management of our forestry resources. We have recently amended the National Trust Act. Early this year, as you've been told, we banned turtle fishing, and just this week we approved new regulations prohibiting commercial exploitation of any shark species in our waters in recognition of the importance of top predators like sharks in sustaining healthy ecosystems and fish populations. The extensive international media coverage of this important accomplishment attests to the fact that we did, what we did domestically is of global significance. 
outside the Bahamas. We have expanded funding to the regional protected area system markedly through the sponsorship with other regional governments. <coughs> the Nature Conservatory and other donor countries and international organizations in the Caribbean challenge. <coughs> the business I'm in is a business that no matter what you do, you never do enough. And whatever you do, people forget the next day and say you haven't done a damn thing. <laughs> but the reality is that we have a very good record on the environment, and we are very pleased to attend this conference here this morning. We are cognizant that communities exist adjacent to national parks and other sensitive ecosystems. And, so, and consequently, those communities impact these systems. Therefore, to effectively plan for those impacts, we need to produce planning principles for development to guide present and future decisions as we seek to foster sustainable communities. The Exoma Land and Sea Park is home to a number of private islands whose private ownership predates the creation of the park and is bordered by a number of other small communities. Oftentimes, that is forgotten in the Bahamas. The existence of private property in and adjoining the park are perfect examples of why we need to ensure sustainable development and land planning for the Exomas and by extension for all our islands. <clears throat> Privately owned islands and keys in the park have over the years been the cause of expressed concern by firstly other owners in the park, secondly the Bahamas National Trust which is responsible for the management of the park and the enforcement of its bylaws. Thirdly, the wider Bahamian community. And finally, by other environmentally conscious citizens. <clears throat> Concerns have ranged from fear of damage to the seabed as a result of dredging, the size and scope of proposed development within or near the park's boundaries, the introduction of commercial activity in the park, the capacity to enforce the bylaws of the park, and the need to develop and enforce new rules. These concerns indicate the need for clear, easily understood and enforceable use of protocols which identify and define sustainable practices and for required sound planning principles inclusive of density rules, building standards, and maintenance. Similar concerns have also been expressed about developments on other islands in the Bahamas, here in Nassau, here in New Providence, at Clifton, and at Albany Resort, in Bimini, the Bimini Bay Resort, in Abaco, the Baker's Bay um, development, in Exoma, at Winding Bay, at Emerald Bay, and just to name a few. One of the things we are not short of in the Bahamas is complaints. It is certainly not the government's policy to impede development, but it has become necessary to require the development of our country, particularly in communities proximate to national parks and protected areas and or sensitive areas, be harmonious with the environment and for them to be governed by the highest standards and best practices so as to accommodate desired and appropriate usage. Today, with the help of the Howard Graduate School of Design, we begin the process for the Exomas. This multi-year initiative, I hope, will analyze the Exomas from environmental, social, economic design, and planning perspectives, and will provide a model for land use plans in other parts of the Bahamas. We've made significant strides as a corporate community along with our international partners to ensure the conservation and preservation of the stunning beauty and natural environment of the archipelagic jewels of the Bahama Islands. It is therefore my hope that this undertaken and the ongoing collaboration will enable us to accomplish even more. It is also my hope that more and more Bahamians will become <coughs> 
become skilled in environmental management and planning and engineering, and that we can have more and more people who can truly cost to be enforced the landmark legislation which we passed in 2010, in respect of which we still do not have adequacy or sufficiency of manpower to really make as effective as it was our hope and intent. And so I wish you the best. I thank you for your participation. I look forward to the fruits of your collaboration. Thank you and good morning. <clears throat>